Hi everyone, I'm Maggie McGrath, Senior Editor at Forbes. On Sunday, Israeli War Cabinet member Benny Gantz announced his resignation from the emergency war government. This produced shockwaves across the media, and here to explain more is Dr. Jonathan Shanzer. He is the Executive Vice President for Research at FDD. He was also a Terrorism Financial Analyst for U.S. Treasury in his past life, and he's here to give us the 50,000 foot view about what all of this means for the future of the war in Israel and what we should all know. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. So let's start very, very broadly. What exactly is this emergency war cabinet? Sure. Well, there are actually three people that are making or that have been making the major decisions in this war. There has been a unity government, which is a much wider patchwork of politicians uh, that uh, joined the government in the aftermath of 10-7 to project a, a, a certain amount of unity. Uh, but there have been three people that have been making the decisions. The first, no surprise, that's Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel. The second, probably also no surprise, uh, and that uh, that's Yoav Gallant. Uh, he's the defense minister. Uh, but they brought in the former chief of staff of the uh, Israel Defense Forces, a guy by the name of Benny Gantz. He uh, controls uh, uh, somewhere around eight uh, seats out of the 120 uh, in Israel's legislature in the Knesset. He does not make up a huge uh, component of the government, but his participation in that war cabinet was seen as a, as a perhaps a means to legitimize the decisions that were being made that it was maybe a reflection of the center left or the, maybe just the center of Israel. Uh, and he, about a month and a half ago, came out and said that he was demanding of Netanyahu that he needed to see a, uh, a plan for the end state in the Gaza Strip. He needed a plan for how to defeat Hamas, and he needed a plan for how to get the hostages home. Uh, he did not get that in uh, after several weeks of waiting. He didn't get a satisfactory answer. In the meantime, there were signs that he was working perhaps more closely with the White House against uh, the Netanyahu government or perhaps against Netanyahu himself. He was invited to Washington last month. He came actually over the objections of the prime minister who was clearly and visibly unhappy about all of this. And then several weeks later, we see his announcement. One last thing I'll just note is that he was actually supposed to make his announcement on Saturday, but that was the day that Israel went in and saved those four hostages in that daring rescue operation. And uh, and so in other words, when uh, Gantz was about to make his announcement, it was overtaken by events. It was not the day for him to make a major announcement like that. It was gonna be overtaken by the headlines. So he postponed it by a day. But uh, the end result was the same. We knew that he was going to do this. And so now there's an open question about whether someone else will come in and be part of these war cabinet deliberations. And then I think there's also the bigger question, which is, will the Netanyahu government begin to unravel? So far, the polls show that Gantz is the one that has lost the support of the Israeli public, not Netanyahu. But of course, again, that comes amidst this daring rescue operation that undeniably uh, lifted Netanyahu. The question is how long it keeps him up in that higher number uh, range, uh, or whether we begin to see that support flag over time as people begin to forget about that rescue operation. So Gantz had said last month that he wanted to see a plan for the hostage release and basically a plan to end the conflict in Gaza, and he did not get that. What does his resignation mean for the future of this war in Gaza? Or what do you think it means? Actually, very little, I think, at least for the short term. Medium term, long term, we don't know. But uh, I think it's fair to say that the Israeli people are defiant right now. They're getting a lot of pressure from the US, from the UN, from the International Criminal Court, from the International Court of Justice. There is a, a really a well-coordinated campaign right now to try to force Israel to stop fighting a war that it neither started nor wanted. But the Israeli public wants to finish off Hamas. They don't want to let this terrorist group continue to exist in the Gaza Strip 
and to be able to rebuild its capabilities to be able to attack again and to kill 1,200 people as we saw happen on 10-7 or to be able to kidnap 240 people as we saw that happened on 10-7. So the Israeli public is, is basically with Netanyahu. Now that doesn't mean that he as a person is uh, as wildly popular as some might think. I think he still has baggage and any leader that's been around for as long as he has, he's going to have his detractors. But the Israeli public is not interested in capitulating and they're not interested in bending a knee, not to the United States, not to the UN, not to anybody, when it is their security that is at stake here. And so I think it's for that reason that Gantz may have miscalculated. Um, it could be the beginning of the unraveling. It could be. But at least for right now, short term, we really don't have any indication uh, that this government is that much less stable. I do think, though, that Netanyahu is going to have some tough choices about who he come, who he brings in to replace Gantz. Um, you know, if, if the idea is to bring in somebody with the kind of credibility that Gantz had as a former chief of staff of the army, um, that's going to be harder to replace. I think there are fewer and fewer people of his ill that have the ability to step into that role. And that may be something that Netanyahu misses. But again, I don't see the Israeli public bending here a whole lot uh, on the question of the war aims itself. You referenced the polling, which I think is really interesting, because prior to Gantz's resignation, there had been some reports suggesting he was popular enough to mount a real challenge in an election, a challenge against Netanyahu. Does that still hold? Could he still, in an election, become the next prime minister of Israel? Yeah, I mean, anything's possible. Um, but I, I think that one of the things that made him popular was that he was actually part of the government. And then as soon as he steps away from the government, uh, he begins to lose support. And, I, you know, it's amazing that, you know, we think about things here in the United States. We talk about our two parties, right? And it's complicated enough when a third party person comes in and begins to eat away at some of the votes that would normally go to the Republicans or the Democrats. In Israel, you know, you've got like a dozen parties and it is three dimensional chess trying to figure out who's going to win. And if you decide if you're gonna vote for one party because you like that party, or do you vote for another party because you think it's the one that will bring in the party that you like into a coalition. It is incredibly difficult to game all of this out and so when we look at these polls, whether the past polls when Gantz was in government or the polls now where he's out, it's still a crapshoot. No one really has any clear idea how Israelis will vote until the day that they walk into that polling station and pull the trigger. The last thing I'll just say on the politics is there's actually a new party that's being formed right now in Israel, and it includes uh, the former head of the Mossad, a guy by the name of Yossi Cohen, who is incredibly popular and charismatic and good looking. We have Naftali Bennett, the former prime minister of Israel, uh, who served for a year in between Bibi's terms um, and a number of other uh, potentially very powerful figures that have been in the Israeli political arena for, for quite some time. They're going to start pulling in numbers, but no one has any idea whether they will pull enough again once those polling stations open, people start making some interesting decisions. This is not anything remotely close to what we deal with in the US. Um, it's far more complicated and I never try to predict who's gonna win anything in the Israeli elections. And a lot of the time, as we've seen in the past, they actually end up being a draw, right? Where the Israelis go to the polls and the numbers are inconclusive and they have to go do it again. Um, and uh, well, it'll be interesting to see how this one starts to play out, but right now, there is nothing forcing the Israelis to go to elections right now. All of this is just sort of idle chatter uh, until someone else decides to depart the coalition. And that's not happened yet. In his resignation, Gantz did suggest or maybe push for an election in the fall. And we saw on Saturday night after the news of the hostages, the four that had been rescued, there were protesters that filled the streets in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, some in support of a deal for further hostage release, but others calling for an election. Are these calls for elections a distraction from the broader conflict and the push for a ceasefire? Well, it's interesting. In the 10 months leading up to the 10-7 attacks of last year, there were protests like these massive protests out on the streets. Um, uh, people calling for Benjamin Netanyahu to resign. 
primarily because he was actually trying to reform the judiciary. He was trying to overhaul it in ways that felt anti-democratic to, uh, to a large number of Israelis. I believe that in many ways, those protests actually yielded the 10-7 attacks. I'm, I'm convinced that the uh, enemies of Israel were watching the unrest and they were thinking that this was actually an ideal moment to attack. And so when we see these large protests coming out into the streets again, um, I do think it's a distraction. I do think that it gives the enemies of Israel a sense that perhaps uh, you know, there is another opportunity that the Israeli people are divided, uh, that they are split over their own leadership, let alone what the way forward would be for victory in Gaza or in any of the other fronts that have opened that Israel is fighting on. And, and there are, by the way, six or seven of those by my count right now. And so, yes, I think that they it could be a distraction. It could undermine the stability of the government. Uh, but, you know, I think we need to acknowledge something here that Israel is a democracy, a vibrant one. And the people obviously have a right to go out and protest whether there is a war or there isn't a war. And if they have strong opinions about their leadership, they have every right to express it. Uh, we just need to keep a close eye on the way in which these things are interpreted uh, by uh, some very vicious enemies of Israel. Jonathan, you mentioned the path forward. And of course, today, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Israel, his eighth trip. He's pushing for a ceasefire deal. The U.N. Security Council approved that deal on Monday. What is your outlook for this conflict? Will we see an end anytime soon? Look, I, you know, right now what we're hearing is the U.S. may be pursuing a side deal with Hamas, which on the one hand could release five hostages, on the other hand, uh, could be a real boost to the credibility or the street cred of Hamas in the Middle East. And I think that is highly problematic. And, and even I think the rumors of this um, is, is could be potentially very damaging because what we're looking at right now, and there are some quotes today in the Wall Street Journal from Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar, who essentially came out and said that he views the deaths of civilians, the bloodshed of Palestinians as something positive for the war effort, that every time another Palestinian is killed, uh, that what this does is it actually boosts his cause, uh, whether it's here in the United States and people protesting uh, for or on behalf of Hamas uh, or in the region itself. And that's what really concerns me right now is uh, we have a Hamas leadership that does not seem willing to bend. And the Israelis do not want to stop fighting until they get a, all the hostages back, and there's around 120 of them right now, but they also want Hamas to have lost its ability to fight moving forward. And I think that's where you're going to see that rub. You're going to see the friction there. Hamas believes that it's winning this war because of the, the terrible PR that Israel is incurring and the pressure that is being placed on Israel by actors across the international system. And so if they think they're winning and the Israelis know that they have the military capability to end this war, and the only thing stopping uh, Israel from doing that is the international community, you can get a sense we're kind of at a three or four way stalemate here. And, uh, and so I think that uh, the, the odds of that ending anytime soon are low. Uh, but then there's the other part of it. And I did already mention that there's five or six or seven different fronts that have already been opened. The Iranian regime has deployed all of its proxies. So these are proxies that are in Gaza, of course, that's like Hamas, and, and also those same proxies, Hamas and Islamic Jihad, they're in the West Bank. You have Hezbollah in Lebanon, you've got Shiite militias in Iraq and Syria, you've got the Houthis in Yemen, and you've got Iran itself, which recently fired hundreds of rockets and drones at Israel. Uh, even if this war were somehow brokered to uh, you know a successful close by the UN or by the US, you, we have to remember here that there are still you know, five or six other fronts that are still open and that are still hot. And the Israelis are going to need to figure out how to deal with them as well. So to me, uh, as a longtime Middle East watcher, I, I don't believe that this thing can be wrapped up in a few weeks. I think there are going to be a lot of loose ends for quite some time. The big one is on the northern border of Israel with Hezbollah. That's a very powerful proxy of Iran, a massive military, a massive arsenal of rockets. They've cleared out 100,000 Israeli citizens from their homes 
along the northern border. They have burned hundreds, if not thousands of acres of arable land. The Israelis are deeply concerned about that situation right now. And that's going to really, I think, uh, prolong any end to this conflict. This is, you know, at least two very hot fronts right now with a bunch of others that could go hot at any moment. You bring up a really interesting point. We've really been watching Gaza quite closely. We saw the All Eyes on Rafa social media campaign a few weeks ago, but you are watching the northern border. So what exactly do people need to know besides what you just said about exactly what is happening on Israel's northern border? Sure. Well, I mean, look, first of all, Hezbollah is a wholly owned proxy of Iran and people need to understand this. And it also happens to have essential full control uh, over the government of Lebanon. There is no government, in fact. I mean, there, there's not been a newly elected government in this country for several years running. They're in massive debt due to Hezbollah corruption. And so there's really, there's no structure to work with right now. So there are all these different, including the US government, the French government, they're all trying to work with the Lebanese to try to um, you know, avert a full-blown conflict, but they don't have legitimate partners to work with. And so, of course, those efforts are failing. I mentioned the 200,000 rockets. That's obviously very concerning for the Israelis. That's something like seven times the amount that Hamas had at the beginning of the war uh, in October of last year. That's a massive amount of rockets that can come into Israel on any given day if a full-blown war begins. Um, they also have what they call precision guided munitions, about 1,500 of those that are extremely accurate and that can hit uh, strategic targets in Israel, like their purported nuclear facility, for example, which could create a mass casualty event. And the Israelis have been very wary of what might occur if a full-blown war erupts. You could see you know, uh, skyscrapers topple in Israel, sort of like what we saw on 9-11 here in this country. So there is a massive war that is just, I mean, I, I talked to an Israeli uh, diplomat the other day who told me that we're 30 seconds to midnight in terms of this conflict. And it would be, in my view, the largest and most destructive war that we have seen in a century in the Middle East. And, you know, obviously there's, there's a lot of competition for destructive wars. So this is a very scary one. And I think that, uh, you know, the headlines have been misleading that uh, you know, in Gaza, Israel's on the five yard line. They're very close to finishing off what they started and they just need the US to essentially give the green light. Um, but that does not uh, really, pay, I mean, it pales in comparison to what we could see on the Northern border. That's where Israel has deployed a massive amount of assets. Uh, they've kept, I think three quarters of their air force free so that they are able to handle the Northern border if and when that conflict erupts. We are 30 seconds to midnight from what you say could be the largest, most consequential conflict in the Middle East in a century. What Correct. could stop the hands of the clock from ticking all the way to midnight there? It's a good question. I mean, there is a school of thought that says, let Israel finish its war in Gaza. And then at that point, Hezbollah may stop fighting. In other words, it would be a sign from the US uh, or from the West that um, you know Israel has the support uh, of its allies and that what after that, Israel would be able to turn its sights fully to the North, potentially again with the backing of the West. That's one way this thing can work. Another way is of course a brokered solution, but that would mean that Hezbollah has to be willing to stand down and to evacuate its forces something like 10 miles north of the border. There is a river, it's called the Latani River. Uh, there is already a UN Security Council resolution that calls for no armed forces, uh, irregular armed forces, below the Latani River at that 10 mile marker. Hezbollah has been in gross violation of that uh, Security Council resolution for nearly, uh, I guess, gosh, two decades now. Um, and so unless we're somehow able to convince Hezbollah to do that, um, I'm not sure how this is going to work, but diplomacy could somehow still prevail. The other way is to actually hold Iran accountable. And I actually think that this is really the answer that is needed here, that Iran needs to be convinced that if it continues to support all of its proxies that are waging war across the Middle East right now, then unless they bring those proxies to heal, that there could be a terrible price diplomatically, economically, even militarily 
But right now, what we've seen from the US, from the UN, from the Europeans, is really an attempt to continue to engage with the regime. And I find this so shocking that the Iranian regime has not been held to account for a war that they have sponsored. You have to remember, it's their arms, their weapons, their money, their training, their ideological indoctrination that has Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, all of these proxies. They are doing this at the behest of the Islamic Republic. And for some reason, the pressure has not been on Iran to this point. I have long held from the moment that this thing uh, erupted in October of last year, that unless we put the right kind of pressure on the Iranians, we're not gonna get anywhere in terms of curbing this conflict. The pressure that we see on Israel right now as it defends itself is really hard to believe. I've never seen anything like this before. The mounting international pressure on a country that didn't want the war, that didn't start the war, and that's trying to recover hostages, how they're the ones that are receiving this pressure from around the world is shocking to me. The aggressor here has been Iran and its proxies. That's where I think the effort needs to be if we're to try to stop the clock at 30 seconds before midnight. The pressure needs to be on Iran. Dr. Jonathan Shanzer, thank you so much for joining us. We so appreciate your insight and hope to have you back soon. My pleasure.